In a remote valley in Nepal, at the foot of the Himalayas, the same ritual is performed every morning. The monks gather at daybreak to pray. Their prayers are for a 16-year-old. A young man who may be the reincarnation of Buddha. Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal, for the last 10 years, the kingdom has been caught in the grip of a civil war, pitting the royalist army against the Maoist rebels. But for the last few months, attention in Nepal has been focused on a young monk who, like Buddha, 2,500 years before him, has begun meditating. Could this teenager have been sent to bring peace to the country? We decided to set out to meet him. The youth comes from a valley in the south of the country, 300 kilometers from the capital. The nearer we got, the more detailed the accounts about him became. When I saw his face, I was surprised. He has the same radiant face as Buddha. I saw a light on the ground, but everyone else says they saw one on his head. Yes, I saw the light, a yellow light that slowly faded away. A few kilometers later, we leave the main road and plunge deeper into the valley. Along the route control post set up by the government, the Maoists aren't far away. We've now reached Baras Forest, the spot the young monk has chosen as his place of meditation. Our path crosses those of groups of pilgrims. They flock here in their hundreds, on foot, by cart or bus. All want a glimpse of the one they call Little Buddha. We draw closer to the sanctuary. Shoes have to be removed here. This is a sacred place. The last 500 meters must be covered barefoot. Colored flags hang from the branches of the trees. Each symbolizes a prayer. This is an open air temple. Hundreds of pilgrims are already here, but it's impossible to get within 50 meters of the young monk. A barrier has been put up around him to protect him so that his meditation won't be disturbed. As with journalists, the guardians allow us into the heart of the sanctuary. A young monk guides us. 25 meters closer, another barrier. And now, here we are at last, in front of the little Buddha. We can't get closer than 10 meters. For the last seven months, the 16-year-old has been meditating under this tree without moving, and according to those closest to him, without eating or drinking. A veil of dust covers him. He appears turned to stone. But after watching him for about 10 minutes, at last, a sign of life. The only person allowed to approach the teenager is a monk named Tral. He's his uncle and also his spokesman, because in seven months, little Buddha has only spoken three times. He said, don't call me Buddha. I have not become Buddha. I ask you, call me the meditator, but not Buddha. You must leave me to meditate for six years. I have a lot of trials to overcome before gaining the knowledge of Buddha. He doesn't eat, 
he doesn't drink, and he doesn't go to the toilet. He doesn't need anything. He stays completely still 24 hours a day. Doesn't he ever move? Never, never. Are you sure he's alive? Yes. I look after him myself and he breathes very, very gently. Every morning at dawn, monks from the neighboring monastery come to pray before the meditator. Their spiritual leader, Guru Ganshaga, firmly believes the boy is genuine. This meditation is a very ancient practice. The position he sits in allows him to store heat. He eats air and his body produces water. When you look at him, you see a normal human being. Inside, he's completely different. When he's hungry, he breathes in a little air and for him it becomes food. Those who haven't read the sacred writings find it difficult to believe, but we have read the sacred writings and the prophecies. That's the difference. People can say what they like about him. It doesn't matter. It's a matter of faith. The world is in a bad state, and I think that's why God has sent him, for peace and to make the world a better place. The reason why the teenager generates such fervor is because of the similarities between his life and Buddha's. Because Buddha really existed. He was born two and a half thousand years ago in this same region of Nepal. His name was Siddhartha. He was a young prince who, through the power of privation and meditation, achieved an exceptional level of wisdom. Like the adolescent, he retired alone into the forest to meditate under a tree before reaching the state of grace that made him a Buddha. In other words, he achieved enlightenment. Furthermore, Trull believes he often spots Buddha's silhouette in the tree. To find out more, we decided to retrace the steps of the young monk. We headed to his village some four kilometers from the spot where he's meditating. It's a small peasant village. There's neither water nor electricity. The locals are Tamang, one of the lowest classes in Nepal's caste system. Ganga, the youth's older brother, acts as our guide. Here is my little brother's school. About 200 children attend the school. There are only two teachers to take care of them. Today, the young monk has become a celebrity they're all proud of. There have been changes since he began meditating. He's doing it for peace, and ever since, the students are better behaved. Were you a friend of little Buddha? When he was a child, he never got into fights. Everybody liked him a lot. He was always laughing.
He had a very good temperament. He was in the habit of obeying his teachers while his classmates fought each other. Then he left school and went to the monastery. He went to study with the monks. In fact, his brother only stayed at the school until the age of eight. After that, he went to study in the monastery. Ganga takes us to the family home next. This is where little Buddha lived, surrounded by his eight brothers and sisters. As is the tradition, his mother gave birth at home in this exact spot, just behind the house. This is where he was born. When he came out of his mother, he let out a huge cry before touching the ground. And after that, he didn't cry anymore. We met little Buddha's mother. She hasn't changed anything about her life. She too talks of a child unlike the others. When he was small, he got into the habit of following the monks. He liked religious places, temples. But on the other hand, he didn't like ceremonies like marriages or gatherings where there were a lot of people. This is his monk's habit, the one he used to wear. It's red and yellow. Now he wears a white habit. That's a photo taken six months ago, and here are the most recent photos. This flask contains a leaf from a sacred tree that my brother gave us as a gift. He's going to meditate for six years. He told us not to lose the flask because if we lose it, he will lose his willpower and his resistance. The family has set up a small shrine in the bedroom of their child prodigy. I come to his room in the morning and in the evening to pray. I light candles and make offerings to the gods. I ask the gods, since you have taken my son, take care of him. Please bless him, show him the way and help him to achieve his goal. When their son retired to the forest to meditate, they didn't understand what was going on. I was very afraid because I didn't understand why he went to the jungle. Before the forest around him was deep, it was very dark. Day was like night. Since people have been coming to see him, it's been cleared. There's much more light. Afraid? Of what? He lives in the jungle. He has been through monsoon rains, storms, and if nothing's happened to him up till now, why should I be afraid? But if your brother fell seriously ill, would you stop his meditation? It would be impossible. No one can stop him. He has made his choice. Even if he falls ill or dies, he will carry on meditating. No one has the right to treat him or even touch him. We must simply make sure his surroundings are peaceful so that his meditation is successful. Anyway, he's with God. I'm quite sure no harm will come to him. He will succeed. I miss him. Sometimes I can't sleep at night because I'm thinking about him. 
I ask the gods why they have taken him from me. Once a month, on the full moon, Maya walks the four kilometers separating her from her son. She crosses the forest on foot accompanied by her youngest daughter. Each of her appearances in the sanctuary has become an event. The pilgrims call her Maya Devi after Buddha's mother. This woman, from one of the lowest castes of Nepalese society, is today venerated as a saint. Everyone wants to get near her. <laughs> Excuse me, could you get out of the way? Please get out of the way, I want a photo. We'd heard talk of God, but we'd never seen him. Today we've seen God and the mother of God. Pilgrims give her money and even prostrate themselves at the feet of her daughter. She's Buddha's little sister. Today we've seen God, Buddha. We are blessed. We are lucky. Before we only had his photo and now we have the true Buddha before us. And we were lucky enough to see Buddha's mother. A few minutes later, Maya goes off on her own to pray. But like all the other pilgrims, at no point will she be able to approach her son. Is it always like this? Are there always so many people around you? Yes. Do you like it? Yes, I like it. In a few months, the little Buddha's become a cult figure. His picture sells for a few rupees at the entrance to the sanctuary, but there are also CDs and DVDs. Anything goes when it comes to selling little Buddha. Ganga, his oldest brother, doesn't like the commercial aspect. He does his best to try to control this frenzy. Why is he doing that? Why is he crossing things out? The author of this book has made mistakes. <laughs> I'm correcting what's not right. For example, it's written here that he hasn't been back to the house since the 2nd of August, but that's not true because he came back the very next day to tell us that we mustn't kill any more animals in our house. Are a lot of people making money out of your brother? Yes, a lot of people are doing well out of him. I don't want them to make money for themselves. All this must stop. But the little Buddha has become an economic manna from heaven for the region. In seven months, this remote valley has seen more than 200,000 Nepalese and Indian pilgrims pass through. A godsend for locals, because all the visitors have to be fed and lodged. Our meals are of the highest quality. Our chef worked in a four-star hotel. It's much better for everyone. It's not just about making money, it's also about the quality of service. 
Is having little Buddha here good for business? Of course. Before, many people here were out of work, but now a lot of them have found jobs. A TV channel attacked Little Buddha, claiming it was just all a setup, just to make money, but that's not true. The first time, they said good things, but then they changed their minds. Now they even suspect him of eating at night time. I don't care what they say, to reach their own truth. It depends if you're a believer or not. In any case, I'm happy because the worse the things they say about him, the more successful his meditation will be. It's good for him. Whatever the critics and the doubters say, donations are flooding in. The village has already received the equivalent of 9,000 euros. The mayor handles the money. We don't spend the little Buddha's money. We don't give it to his family. We're going to use between 10 and 20,000 rupees to build a road from the village to the sanctuary. And in the future, we'd like to build a monastery. Are you happy? Of course. Why? It's changed a lot of things in the village. Since he went off, the village has been very calm. People don't fight anymore. We believe that it's from the village that peace will spread throughout the rest of the country. The little Buddha's presence seems to be benefiting everyone in the valley. But is he a fake? Two months ago, the Nepalese government sent a team of doctors to observe him. They were only allowed within 10 meters of him. To find out whether he's secretly being fed, a blood test would be needed, and those close to him won't allow that. So what really happens at night? Among the pilgrims, we met a New Zealander who spent 24 hours in front of the young monk. Religion and philosophy, yoga. And uh, I heard about the tapasvi in Kathmandu. So I came down here to uh, just to investigate and especially to stay overnight because this is what people were doubting that uh, what's happening at night when that's supposedly closed. So they let me in and then. Uh, it was a long, long winter night and very cold. And I felt very sympathetic for him, very sad. And I thought he must be very amazing control. Has the young monk developed extraordinary abilities? It's impossible to verify. Is he really conscious? A tourist who filmed him for a long period gave us this tape. For a few moments that morning, the adolescent opened his eyes. He even smiled. We left the valley without getting any answers to our questions. Back in Kathmandu, we decided to visit the temple of Budnath. It's one of the most important Buddhist centers in Nepal. Here we met the monk, Choki Nima Rimposh. He's a recognized religious authority in Nepal and is close to the Dalai Lama. Mind has a lot of power. Mind can control body and speech. Mind can, if, you know, if we go mind certain, certain deep level, we can control five elements, not only body. 
we shouldn't talk too much and we shouldn't disturb too much. Let him practice. And yeah, wait and see. Definitely this is good. This is sign of meditation. Okay? Meditation is this power like that. This people know more and more. It's a very good thing. But we shouldn't disturb. <laughs> Today, many Nepalese want to believe in him, want to believe that this 16-year-old, using only the power of meditation, will restore peace to this land torn apart by war.